Good morning or afternoon as the case may be. I'm David Gantz, the Will Clayton Fellow at the Baker Institute. And on behalf of the Institute and the Center for the US and Mexico, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second of our series of fall webinars on various aspects of the implementation of NAFTA. I will note very briefly that on uh, October 14, uh, there will be a program focusing on autos and auto trade. Uh, on November 18th, one focusing on the environmental provisions. And on the 9th of, sept of December, uh, a webinar that focuses on the nitty gritty of customs, the stakeholders uh, issues with moving goods back and forth. But today we are going to focus on investments and investment protection, ISDS, under um, the USMCA. We are very fortunate to have a, an expert group with us today, uh, Celine Levesque has been a professor at the University of Ottawa for over 20 years. She was dean for five years during that period. She's also president of the Canadian Council on International Law. Uh, her expertise is primarily in international investment law. She served in many chapter 19 cases as an arbitrator, and she also spent uh, several years uh, working with the Trade Law Bureau of the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, which defends uh, Canada uh, when a, uh, an investment case is filed. Hugo Perescano is uh, an international arbitrator and consultant originally from Mexico, again, specializing in international dispute trade, settlement trade and investment. Uh, he worked for Mexico's Ministry of the Economy for about 20 years, where he served as head of Mexico's trade remedy authority. Um, he was lead counsel for Mexico in numerous investor state dispute cases under NAFTA during that period and also under some of Mexico's BITs. He was also responsible for managing uh, state to state dispute settlements under NAFTA and uh, cases uh, that Mexico brought or was responded in, um, in the under the World Trade Organization rules. Uh, Simon Lester um, is the associate director of the Herbert A. Stifel Center for Trade Policy at the Cato Institution, uh, where he focuses on WTO disputes, regional trade agreements, disguised protectionism, and the history of international trade law. Now, for those of us who are often uh, involved in trade issues, he uh, uh, presents the key website, the World Trade Law Net, uh, and uh, also uh, the International Economic Law and Policy blog. He's taught at a number of law schools, including uh, Washington College of Law and the University of, Mich of Michigan. Finally, uh, the uh, moderator for today is George Gonzalez, uh, a partner in um, Haynes and Boone, uh, to which we're also grateful as a major sponsor of this series. Uh, his practice is quite varied in, in business and international uh, business, uh, te technology, technology mergers and acquisitions, chemicals. Um, he's part of the energy mergers and acquisitions and international practice groups at Haynes and Boone, uh, and he counsels a wide range of domestic and foreign uh, clients on all of these issues. So, George, the floor virtually is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, Haynes and Boone is delighted to collaborate with the Rice Baker Institute Mexico Center. Um, this is a very important topic to us, and we have a terrific panel for the audience today. We have experts on U.S. trade, experts on Canadian trade, and experts on Mexico trade, as David indicated. Um, we're going to start with a few uh, a brief presentation by each of our panelists, so you get a sense for what they think is important as it relates to this topic and their backgrounds. Um, and we're going to start with Celine. First, I'd like to thank the Baker Institute and Professor David Gans for their kind invitation. And thank you, uh, George, for your opening. It's a pleasure to join you today from Ottawa, where it's not winter yet. You'll be glad to hear. As mentioned in the introduction, the USMCA has changed dramatically the way disputes between investors and states will be resolved in the future under the agreement. In particular, after a three-year transition period, investor state dispute settlement or ISDS will no longer be available between the US and Canada. 
In my introductory remarks, I'd like to focus on this and explore one question. What are the implications of eliminating ISDS between the US and Canada in terms of remedies for investors? In order to do so, I'll consider two alternatives. The first one is domestic remedies. During the debates on this subject, you may have heard statements to the effect that ISDS is not needed between the US and Canada because both countries have sophisticated court system, etc. I'd like to test that a bit, looking at the protection US investors could expect from Canadian courts to see if it would be equivalent to what such an investor could get under NAFTA Chapter 11. And the second alternative I'll look at is state-to-state -state dispute settlement under the USMCA. Of course, this would not provide a direct uh, remedy to investors, but again, I'll explore what might result from such a process. So starting with domestic remedies. Let's imagine a US investor that suffers damages as a result of government measures in Canada. What kind of remedies can it expect from the courts? Before answering this question, I'd like to set the stage a bit by briefly recalling Canada's experience under NAFTA Chapter 11. I'll only refer to arbitrations that led to a final decision or to a settlement. So based on publicly available information, I get to 18 cases in about 24 years. 10 wins, eight losses, including three settlements that provided for the payment of compensation by Canada. So back to domestic alternatives to ISDS. One might ask if these cases had been tried in Canadian courts, would the eight investor have gotten equivalent remedies or monetary damages? To answer this question, I'll refer to research done by some Canadian colleagues, Professor Armand de Metral and Robin Morgan in 2016. Their research was broader than the cases I just referred to. They looked at 35 claims against Canada by US investors, even those that never proceeded or were uh, withdrawn. What they found was that out of the 35 claims at the time, a majority would not have received equivalent remedies as they could have under NAFTA Chapter 11. There's no time to explore their findings in any detail, but I'll give you a few hints so you can get a flavor of the reasons. First, Canada does not have constitutional protection of property rights. So while the protection of compensation for expropriation is well established, it's not equivalent to U.S. takings law and expropriation without compensation can legally occur. Number two, while the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom does include a provision on equality and non-discrimination, it does not apply to corporations. And three, when a U.S. investor challenges a law itself or an administrative action, it may get the law invalidated, say because it's unconstitutional, or obtain a favorable judicial review, but it generally will not be able to obtain damages. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that such remedies do not have value. Indeed, they may just be what the investor was looking for. As a matter of fact, in many Chapter 11 cases against Canada, the US investors did have recourse to the domestic courts. However, when they were left unsatisfied, they were able to turn to arbitration under NAFTA Chapter 11. So let me close the loop on domestic remedies. Based on the analysis performed by Professor Demetral and his colleague, and if we look only at the eight claims that led to the payment of damages, the majority would not have received compensation in Canadian courts. So this provides a perfect transition to my second alternative. What about state-to-state -state dispute settlement under the USMCA? I'll say a brief word about basic rules before raising some questions. First, while ISDS will not apply between the US and Canada after the transition period, the obligation of the investment chapter, chapter 14, 
will continue to apply between the US and Canada. So if you look at the scope of, Artic of chapter 31, state-to-state uh, -state dispute settlement, uh, it provides that the chapter applies to the avoidance or settlement of disputes between the parties regarding the interpretation or application of this agreement. And when a party considers that an actual or proposed measure of another party is or would be inconsistent when a, with an obligation of this agreement. So in terms of scope, this provision appears capacious enough to cover investment disputes. I will not cover the procedures uh, as such for state-to-state -state dispute settlement and other panelists uh, may, so I'll just jump ahead to remedies as this is my focus. Article 31, 18 of the USMCA provides for the implementation of the final reports of panels. In broad terms, this article provides that if a finding is made that the measure at issue is inconsistent with the party's obligation in this agreement, the disputing parties, and I quote, shall endeavor to agree on the resolution of the dispute. And the resolution of the dispute is defined as comprising the elimination of the non-conformity, if possible, the provision of mutually acceptable compensation or another remedy the disputing parties may agree. If that fails, then one moves to suspension of benefits, which will be a concept familiar to those trade law uh, experts amongst you. All right, so the text does mention compensation. Could it be a way to get equivalent damages to investors as occurred in the context of NAFTA Chapter 11? One answer can be found on the Global Affairs website where the US MCA investment chapter is summarized. The quote acknowledges that the US government could bring a claim, a claim against Canada on behalf of US investors under state to state dispute settlement, but adds, and I quote, however, if successful, such claim would not result in the award of any damages. So that's one answer. More generally, where does the prospect of state-to-state -state dispute settlement leave us? Let me share a couple of thoughts. Will recourse to state-to-state -state dispute settlement lead to the repolitization of investment disputes? Well, it's hard to consider this topic without thinking about the rules on the diplomatic protection of aliens and their downsides. Who gets the ear of the government? Of course, investors lose control of the process. And the chance of getting damages, as we've just seen, are unclear. I also wonder whether such recourse would fundamentally change the nature of the remedies available under international investment law. There used to be a clear distinction between trade and investment law remedies. For trade, the remedies were prospective. If successful, the complaining state could see a repeal of the offending measure for the future. For investment, the remedies were retrospective. The aggrieved investor could get compensation for past damages, but the measure itself would stay intact. As the US MCA changed this paradigm, at least between the US and Canada, I'll just stop there. I hope my remarks on the implications of eliminating ISDS between the US and Canada have provided some food for thought and I look forward to the discussion. So I'll pass the floor to Hugo Perescano. Thanks. Thank you, Celine. And uh, first of all, I want to join Celine in thanking uh, Rice and the Baker Institute for uh, Institute Center for the US and Mexico, and in particular, David Gans for the invitation to uh, share the floor with my colleagues, Simon and uh, George, and, and to share some thoughts with you all on the differences between the new NAFTA, the USMCA, and uh, the old NAFTA chapter 11. 
generally speaking, I think that the differences can be divided into two broad groups. First of all, we have some changes in the uh, new NAFTA that concern the investment protections, the substantive investment protections. And uh, secondly, and more fundamentally, the changes uh, are in, as Selene uh, uh, noted, in the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, ISDS. So I would quickly like to run through some of the more salient points in the investment protection so that I can devote a little bit more time to ISDS as well from uh, the Mexican perspective. Um, the, some of the, 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 this will not be an exhaustive list, of course, uh, these are just what in my view are the most salient points, but we have first of all, the, a change in the definition of investment. The definition of investment went from um, an exhaustive definition to an open-ended definition subject to the Cellini test. So if we look at both definitions, <clears throat> NAFTA chapter 11 says investment means, and that lists uh, all the investments, all the covered investments uh, under NAFTA chapter 11. And in chapter 14 of the USMCA, we have investment means every asset that has the characteristics of the investment and then refers to the Cellini test. So commitment of capital or, or their resources, the expectation of profit or gain and the assumption of risk, risk among others. Um, so that, that is one and uh, uh, we may uh, later uh, be able to discuss some of the implications, but that is one important change. Then there are a bunch of clarifications that have been, that are either new to the NAFTA or in the NAFTA context, uh, or that have, are not new, but have been incorporated. They were lying around in the commission notes of interpretation. And the, the uh, but at any rate, they've been there for a while. Um, and this include, for instance, uh, the commission, Free Trade Commission of Interpretation notes uh, concerning the minimum standard of treatment, transparency provisions, expropriation, specifically indirect expropriation. They've been now incorporated into the chapter. There are uh, a few others that uh, are new, again, in the NAFTA context, but still mainstream in the context of the discussions between uh, countries such as, uh, for instance, the um, uh, compensation in the case of armed or civil strife has now been uh, promoted to an individual status. It's, it's now an individual uh, provision in and of itself. There have been, uh, uh, there are some clarifications to like circumstances in the context of national treatment and a most favored uh, treatment and the incorporation of a mild uh, provision on corporate social responsibility. And perhaps the, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, change that I will refer to is the provision on subrogation, which was purposely left out during the NAFTA negotiations, and now it is incorporated uh, into the, the chapter. But let me now turn to uh, investor state dispute settlement. Of course, as uh, Celine pointed out, the uh, US and Canada opted out of uh, ISDS entirely, and Mexico and the US ended up with a very washed down uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanism. And the first change that I would like to point out, and in my view, the more fundamental one is that as far as I know, this is the first time that the US does not place the protection of US interests at the forefront. So based on a myopic view of the economy and international trade and investment perhaps, but the US has walked away from what has been a central element in its uh, foreign policy, which is the protection of US interests, not only within the US, but abroad. Um, and to put it in context, I would like to uh, refer to the original NAFTA negotiations. 
As some of you may know, this was originally a Mexican idea. Mexico was the first to propose to the U.S. to have a free trade agreement. There was a meeting between President Salinas and President Bush, George Bush Sr. Mexico said it would be a good idea for us to have a free trade agreement. And the U.S. said, fine, but on one condition. It has to be a comprehensive trade and investment agreement. So all duties have to uh, have to go eventually. We can we can discuss phase out periods, but all tariffs have to be eliminated. Uh, we have to incorporate what was then the new topics being negotiated in the Uruguay round trade and services and intellectual property and a comprehensive investment chapter with ISDS and significant liberalization uh, on the part of Mexico. A few months after Canada, uh, Mexico and the U.S. began the discussions, Canada approached uh, uh, the U.S. and Mexico and said, you know, we have, Canada and the U.S. have a free trade agreement uh, that covers all of these points, so it would be a good idea to make the NAFTA trilateral. And one of the conditions that the U.S. imposed was that there be ISDS between the U.S., between the three NAFTA parties. The investment chapter in the 1987 FDA did include investment protections, but did not include ISDS, and that was one of the conditions for the U.S. So fast forward 25 years, and the U.S. has now walked away from that. Uh, what was it at the time uh, a fundamental point of uh, negotiation? We'll have to see in time the implications, but I think, again, while not a change in the agreement itself, it is reflected in the new USMCA, and in my view, it is uh, the more fundamental change, uh, and, and, and again, I think where the greater implications are yet to be seen. In terms of the provisions uh, or the mechanism itself as between the US and Mexico, for three points uh, to, or rather two points uh, to make. The first one is that for investments in general, only uh, claims for breach of national treatment, MFN, and direct expropriation are admissible. So no more claims uh, for breach of uh, uh, fair and equitable treatment or more broadly the minimum standard of treatment, no performance requirements, no indirect expropriation, no claims for breach of uh, uh, the transfers provisions and so on and so forth. And even in the context of most favored nation, it is it, it excludes more favorable treatment that uh, either of the parties may grant to um, other countries under free trade agreements. So even there, it is more limited. For five specific sectors, claims for breach of all other provisions, those and all other provisions uh, of NAFTA or the new NAFTA Chapter 14 can be brought, but again, they are significantly restricted. So the five sectors, they're restricted in two ways in terms of the sectors uh, uh, themselves and, and what they encompass and because they have to be tied into government contracts. So the five sectors are uh, oil and gas, where the activities are controlled by the state, telecom services, but where they are provided as a public service uh, on behalf of a party, transportation services, likewise, uh, when they are provided to the public on behalf of a party, um, the supply of power generation, so not distribution, only power generation, and again, as a public service on behalf of the party, and certain infrastructure. So again, very limited. And uh, the third uh, point that I, the third difference that I would like to refer to, and I'll, I'll uh, stop there, is that in the NAFTA negotiations, the three NAFTA parties uh, consciously moved away from the exhaustion of local remedies rule, and now they've incorporated. There is uh, a, uh, an obligation to exhaust local remedies or at least to resort to domestic courts uh, for at least uh, 30 months. And that has that entails uh, some of the problems that Celine has already referred to in the context of remedies and uh, a few others. But uh, I will stop there and hopefully we'll have 
uh, a chance during the question and answer session to discuss some of the implications. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Simon so that he can provide uh, a better view on the U.S. perspective. Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Hugo. Uh, thank you to the Baker Institute um, and for David Gantz for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, good to be here with my fellow panelists and for the, uh, the audience out there somewhere virtually. Uh, as the American on the panel, it, it makes sense for me to, to focus on the U.S. perspective on ISDS. And in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how we got to where we are with ISDS in the USMCA, um, and then where might the U.S. be going now? And I think in doing so, I'm going to kind of pick up on some of the, the themes that, that Hugo brought up. So to take us back in time a bit, um, when the NAFTA was negotiated, as people probably know, it was extremely controversial here in the United States. There was a heated political debate, which continues to this day. What's interesting, though, is that ISDS and investment protection were not a big part of that initial controversy, even though including ISDS in, in NAFTA was one of its biggest innovations. If you, if you read through the debates from that time, so the, the famous Al Gore versus Ross Perot debate on the Larry King show, um, which I have done just to see what people were saying about ISDS, ISDS doesn't even make an appearance there. Uh, there's lots of talk about this giant sucking sound of jobs going from the US to Mexico, uh, but ISDS doesn't really come up. The issues of the day were all about the low wages and weak environmental protections in Mexico and how big corporations would move there to take advantage of that. U.S. corporations moving to Mexico might suggest a role for ISDS, but no one seemed worried about foreign investors suing governments for millions or billions and challenging domestic laws and regulations at the time. And I think the simple explanation for this is that um, at, at the time, ISDS litigation was in its infancy. All of the words were there on paper in bilateral investment treaties, but they hadn't been used much. So people just didn't have a great sense of what the implications were. It, it was noteworthy that, that NAFTA allowed two developed countries to use ISDS against each other, which was, was not the norm. But for most people, that probably suggested fewer cases rather than more, thinking, ah, the sophisticated legal systems and strong rule of law would make ISDS unnecessary. But then after a few years of, of creative lawyering and the experience of uh, the NAFTA Chapter 11 cases, ISDS became a center of controversy. Uh, you know, there are a number of concerns out there. The idea of regulatory chill, these expensive lawsuits against public policy measures will deter important regulations. There's a general concerns about corporations getting preferential treatment. Why do corporations get the, this ability to sue, whereas labor unions do not? And then a whole list of uh, specific aspects of the ISDS process and substance of investment protection also were, were raised. So in response to that, the trade establishment has been trying to rein ISDS in a bit ever since by placing various procedural and substantive limits on it. NAFTA Chapter 11 was a pretty broad, traditional investment protection agreement, whereas more recent agreements have narrowed things somewhat in terms of both the substance and the procedure. And I think it's fair to say that it's harder to win cases under these new rules than it was under the old rules. But none of that has satisfied the critics. Uh, they keep pushing to get rid of ISDS completely. So even though ISDS has changed, uh, the fight continues. And it's, it's worth noting that this is a global issue. We're focusing here on the NAFTA and the USMCA parties. Um, but there are domestic and international reform efforts underway around the world. So Australia, to take one example, has been going back and forth on ISDS, depending on which party is in power. The EU, uh, in, in the EU, ISDS became controversial as part of the US-EU trade talks, and they're now engaged in an effort to replace investment arbitration with a multilateral investment court. And of course, developing countries are having second thoughts as well. It's hard to say exactly how the Trump administration fits into this broader story. Perhaps there was a bit of uncertainty about how President Trump would view ISDS. Uh, he does like to sue, uh, so that might have, suggested, might have suggested he would be a big supporter of it. But ultimately, the, the combination of generalized nationalism um, plus a specific desire to have more U.S. investment at home rather than abroad seemed to push towards a scaling back of ISDS in the USMCA. A key player here is the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, who has said, he sees ISDS as subsidizing U.S. companies who invest abroad, and that's something the Trump administration wants to see less of. Then in 2018, 
Uh, when the Democrats took control of the House, the anti-ISTS sentiment in Congress increased. ISTS tends to be supported for my business groups of Republicans with more skepticism from, from Democrats. And so these are the political dynamics that left us with a USMCA that, as my colleagues on the panel have explained, significantly pulls back on ISDS. And it's clear that it was the US uh, pushing for these changes. Canada and Mexico are generally supportive of some form of ISDS, although they do have their concerns as well. Uh, Celine and Hugo have, have done a good job giving us a basic overview. They've done all the heavy lifting uh, in terms of, of where we, we've ended up. I'm just gonna add one quick point about state-to-state -state dispute settlement that I, I thought was worth noting. So you, the USMCA has this roster of 30 panelists who are available to hear state-to-state -state complaints. And if you look at the list, there, there are certainly a lot of trade lawyers on there. So you, you, you might ask whether trade experts will be able to handle these investment issues. There is some overlap, but they aren't the same. Uh, I will note two things, though. Uh, the first is that both of my co-panelists are on that roster, and they clearly know ISDS. So there are investment experts on the roster that we can turn to. Uh, also, by my count, five of the 10 roster members put forward by the U.S. have an international arbitration background. And you could take this different ways. I mean, if you if you you could take that to suggest that the U.S. sees Chapter 30, 31 as an appropriate forum for investment disputes and wants to make sure that it can use it for that purpose. On the other hand, it might just be that uh, the particular Trump administration uh, officials in charge of this came from that field and, and put forward the people that they they knew from their past practice. So that's how we got here and what we have with ISDS and the USMCA. So. Let me talk now a little bit about where things are going, or may be going, in terms of future U.S. policy on ISDS. I would say that the issue is far from settled. Regardless of who is president uh, in the next term, Trump or Biden, whoever comes after that, and regardless of who controls Congress, the Democrats or Republicans, I would say there's likely to be a debate over this in each prospective agreement that's being considered. And I can't say with great certainty where things will come out. There does seem to be a trend away from ISDS, but will it ever completely disappear? I'm not so sure, especially with regard to past agreements, which are very difficult politically to, to revise or to, to terminate. Importantly, I, I think, I, ISDS is still there in the US Trade Negotiating Authority statute. Uh, that was enacted by Congress in 2015 as a required component of, of U.S. trade agreements. So, and that should mean something, although who knows anymore, um, to satisfy the terms of the trade negotiating authority that's been granted uh, to the executive branch. The U.S. administration should include ISDS in its comprehensive FTAs. Now, it will be interesting to see what happens with the next grant of trade negotiating authority. Uh, things may change. So let's now just talk about the, the various players to watch here going forward and their view of ISDS. So we've got you know, the administration, whoever it's going to be. We've got Congress. And we've got various interest groups. With regard to the administration, obviously, it depends who wins the election. My sense is that the core of the Trump trade policy team, and, and when I say that, I'm thinking here of U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, they're pretty strongly against ISDS personally. However, I think they are willing to compromise in order to get deals done. And I think the example that you see here is um, the, the, the special rules that apply to certain sectors of, of in, uh, in, the, in the Mexican economy. So, you know, oil and certain other sectors are covered. Beyond that, there are certainly plenty of people in the Trump administration, State Department folks, USTR career staff who are, are still for it. So, if, so in a Trump administration second term, I do think ISDS is still an option if someone with influence wants it badly enough. Now, as for a Biden administration, the Biden trade policy team is going to see an internal battle between moderate supporters of ISDS and adamant opponents. And I'm not sure who's going to win that. They are going to have a big fight over trade policy in general, and ISDS will be one small part of that larger battle. Uh, turning to Congress, I, I think the House of Representatives is pretty much all set. I think everyone assumes it will remain Democratic, but the the, election in, the elections in the Senate are very important here. A Democratic Senate would be likely be more opposed to ISDS than a Republican Senate. You have key players in the Democratic Party, like Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Bernie Sanders, who are strong opponents with a lot of influence, and they will have more say if the Democrats are in control. 
And then in terms of interest groups, uh, you have the business community out there who thinks this is worth fighting for. Uh, as long as it exists in some form somewhere, U.S. business groups will argue that they should have access to the same remedy that their competitors in foreign countries have. And on the other hand, you have these various NGOs who, who hate it will keep lobbying against it. So these are all the players to, to watch in sorting out particular balance by SDS and U.S. trade policy going forward. In theory, we could come to some permanent resolution here, an agreed form of ISDS that, that lasts in perpetuity, or no ISDS. Um, but I don't think that will happen. I think the debate will continue. Now, maybe we just don't do trade and investment agreements for a while in the United States, which I think is possible, in which case the issue will be moot. But as long as we are out there negotiating these agreements, I, I think the issue will be contested. So uh, I'll wrap up with that. I look forward to discussing more of these issues in, in the Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, turn it back to George. Uh, um, Thank you, Simon. Uh, really three terrific presentations by three experts in trade. I think it might be useful to start the discussion by st taking a step back and thinking about the NAFTA generally and the purpose of dispute resolution. So when you look at the NAFTA over the last 20 years, there have been incredible uh, trade flows and investment. I think trade between the U.S. and Canada and Mexico approximately over those that 20-year span increased by three times, so, so it's tripled. GDP uh, in each of the three respect, uh, respective companies grew significantly. So, and, and as we discussed uh, uh, among reasons for modernizing the NAFTA, among them, you, ISDS was not the top, the, the main topic. It was addressing e-commerce, addressing other points. So. Interesting to me, even when you think about Simon's discussion of some of the criticisms of ISDS, it were things like regulatory chill or uh, or co preferences for corporations or process issues, not questions of whether or not the system worked or not generally for the, per the parties it was meant to work for, which are investors. So the, the, the real question, it seems to me, is what is likely to happen to investment? What is the investment community? What are companies going to look at when they decide where they're going to make their next uh, decision as to where they're going to significantly invest in a big project, big infrastructure development, or whatever the, uh, the, the, the topic is? I know, for instance, in Houston, we were very happy to have oil and gas and power as a specifically covered topic for ISDS as it relates to Mexico. And you combine that with the opening in energy in Mexico, those are very powerful uh, forces to, to encourage investment into, into Mexico. So my first question would be, I think, and this is for all panelists, but I'll start with Simon. I think if you think about you know, uh, what you referenced with respect to Lighthizer's topic about, uh, or perspective about ISDS potentially uh, subsidizing U.S. investment abroad. And so if, you, if the perspective is, what do we need to do to increase the, the, the likelihood that investment would happen domestically in the United States as opposed to elsewhere, the, the question for our three panelists is, what do we think, what do we collectively think the answer to that is? Is he right? You know, is ISDS, you know, his, the, his perception of ISDS as potentially an infringement on U.S. sovereignty and encouraging investment in, in, uh, in, in other jurisdictions. Is that correct? What do we expect might happen uh, from a weaker investment protection scenario as it relates to investments in the U.S.? Will investment in the U.S. increase or will it not as a result of this change? Thank you. Thank you, George. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, you would think that with decades of experience with uh, ISDS litigation, we would have a clearer answer to this question of what impact does it have on cross-border investment flows. Um, but as I read the, the studies by economists and political scientists who have looked at this question, I, I see uncertainty. You know, they, they just, they haven't reached a definitive conclusion on whether ISDS and investment protection actually encourage foreign investment. Some studies find a positive effect on investment flows, whereas others do not. And I, I think it's a very hard thing to measure, especially when you're talking about bilateral treaties and, and corporate structures set up to take advantage of them. 
Uh, just as an as an anecdote, I mean, I'll note that when I'm on a, a panel talking about ISDS and I have a, a business person there uh, with me, I, I you know I often ask them, you know, what effect does this have on your decision to invest? And they always say none. For whatever that's worth, that's what they say. I, and this is you know small sample size, just the people I happen to ask. What I think these USMCA changes will do is give us a, an opportunity for a natural experiment here. What now happens to U.S.-Canada cross-border investment after ISDS disappears? And what happens with U.S.-Mexico investment in the, the, sec the special sectors that are covered with you know, fuller protections versus the sectors that are not? I think that economists and political scientists are going to have a field day with this data and maybe we'll get some clearer answers. I'm, I'm sorry not to give you a more specific prediction of my own, but just having read all of these studies over the years, I just I just don't know. And, I, and I'm looking forward to you know, maybe this is the opportunity to, to finally find out. Thank you, Simon. Celine, do you have a perspective on what likely impact this will have on trade flows? I'll let Ugo go first. I think he probably has more to say than me on this. Thanks, Selena. George, very happy to. Uh, I, I think there we, we have to take a broader look. I, I disagree with Simon and, uh, and many others that continue to hold the view that, uh, you know, there are statistics that prove that ISDS does not in, in, uh, improve investment flows. I think that is the wrong way to look at the issue. That is a very uh, nearsighted view. Uh, and what really promotes investment flows, and we can take Brazil, or at least Brazil a few years ago <clears throat> as an example, is if there is a stable framework, if there are rules, if there is uh, the rule of law, investment will flow with or without investment agreements. Investment agreements as a whole certainly uh, uh, help to improve investment flows. But going back to your question, uh, George, uh, you know, you, you, you refer to how dramatically trade and investment flows uh, increased after the NAFTA uh, came into force. But that was not, investment flows were not you know, the result of the investment chapter. It was the result of the NAFTA as a whole, including the investment chapter, the trade liberalization. It made more sense to invest in a country where you know trade was large, trade in services, trade in goods was largely being liberalized, and it made sense. Made sense in terms of the broader Mexican economic policy, uh, which has been fairly stable, and we'll see what happens uh, uh, now. But for, for nearly four decades. But so to look at ISDS and try to figure out if ISDS on its own increases or decreases flows, I think is the wrong way to look at it. What I think will happen uh, it, it, with or without, or with a wash down ISDS, again, that doesn't really depend on the mechanism per se. Um, and again, let, let's take a look at it in, a, in, in context. With a Trumpian and Lighthizer myopic or nearsighted view, if you think about the auto sector, or perhaps the steel sector, what, if they were thinking of making an investment in Mexico, will they now make it an investment uh, in, in the US? It may or may not happen. Uh, if we look at Ford, I don't think it really happened uh, for back in uh, 2016. But if you look at the broader, uh, uh, the broader agents in the economy, take a look at, at Walmart. Will uh, the lack of ISDS encourage Walmart to open another supermarket uh, in the US? Hardly, it's got its spaces covered. It will open as many as are needed in the US and it will seek to invest abroad. If there is an opportunity and there is certainty to do it in Mexico, it will do so. And broad, uh, you know, Walmart is one of the largest uh, employers 
in the world. If you look at the financial services sector, if you look at the, the, the broader and perhaps even today more important services sector, will ISDS change their view? There, I agree with those who say, uh, who have been telling Simon, you know, this doesn't make much of a difference. However, if circumstances, if the, the regulatory uh, framework changes in Mexico, that will have an impact. And it may well happen. We're seeing Lopez Obrador backing away from the energy reforms. He's already said that we will not uh, go through new rounds of negotiations in the energy sector. We will strive to, to uh, you know, fortify Pemex and CFE. And, uh, you know, he comes from, uh, he is really not a leftist. He is someone, many other considerations aside, he, he, he thinks that there should be a strong state, strong state intervention and strong state intervention in the economy specifically. And that may well change the, the uh, panorama. And lastly, in, in this context, I would say where a U.S. investor is faced with the choice of investing in Mexico, bringing back its investment to the U.S. And again, I, I, I think of a, a, a Walmart or perhaps investing in Costa Rica or um, uh, Colombia, uh, where the U.S. has other agreements. Uh, I think it's likely that the, the U.S. Uh, uh, that U.S. investors will decide to make their investment elsewhere, where costs are, are higher, where there are good opportunities, and where they face more certainty, than bringing it back to the U.S. Thank you, Hugo. I, I think uh, in one of your broader points there is that it's. The investment decision depends on many different things, not just the dispute resolution mechanisms. There are, there's a whole panoply of, of influence points. And so as the economies continue to improve or not after this, during this pandemic, that will be a big, a big uh, impulse as to where the investment flows go. Um, but I do think dispute resolution me me mechanics, as it relates to a party's likelihood of getting the benefit of his bargain, those things are critical to the initial analysis of where do we go, and then once we go, how do we protect the downside with respect to that investment? I'd like to, and I'm going to come back to you, Hugo, about uh, specific points as to AMLO and how the, how the uh, these changes may affect uh, his his uh, his um, policy goals. But Celine, I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, in your presentation, you you discussed how in Canada, there is not the similar uh, uh, provision like the U.S. Fifth Amendment, which is a uh, protection or prohibition on, on takings without just uh, payment. Um, you also discussed a, a uh, analyses where had some of these uh, some of these disputes gone to Canadian courts, the likelihood is that a Canadian court would not have uh, provided damages. So. If, you, if, if sophisticated investors are looking at these components, you know, not a built-in system of protection at a, at a constitutional level with respect to unjust takings, together with an analysis of what would have happened uh, to some of these Chapter 11 disputes had they gone to the, to the Canadian courts, are you worried at all about investment in Canada as it relates to those two topics? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, not really, I have to say, and I'll uh, build a bit on what my colleagues said before. I think investment decisions are made uh, based on multiple factors. The Canadian and U.S. economy are highly integrated, and they'll continue to be uh, in autos and energy, many other sectors where there's close relationships. Uh, so I don't think that it will matter, and I don't think... Uh, Probably most U.S. investors would be aware that Canada doesn't have constitutional protection of property rights. Uh, it was debated uh, when we adopted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it was decided against, which does not mean that we don't have uh, an expropriation, expropriation rules and expropriation laws that do provide compensation. But in terms of equivalency, if you compare the U.S. regime and the Canadian regime, there's more room in Canada 
for the state to expropriate if it does so uh, explicitly uh, to expropriate without uh, offering to pay compensation. Uh, and that can become an issue again in a minority uh, of cases as uh, we've seen with Abitibibo water, for example, in the NAFTA chapter 11 context and another case I could uh, mention. Uh, so I don't think it would be a factor uh, more so than it was uh, before. Thank you, Celine. Um, important differences between the U.S. and Canadian system that I think many people may not have been aware of. I'm glad to hear that there's not an expectation that that's going to be affecting any significant change in investment. Um, I'd like to go back to Hugo and ask um, what, what, as I said at the beginning of the discussion, in Houston we were very happy to see oil and gas and power as specifically covered topics for ISDS. Obviously those are big, significant topics to the economy of Texas and in the economy of Houston in particular. I think um, one, of the, one of the elements that has not yet been fully uh, understood is the scope of, for instance, the infrastructure uh, item that's, that's also addressed as a covered topic. Um, we just had a recent discussion with uh, some of AMLO's trade representatives, and one of the things that we, at least we understand, is a key um, uh, suggestion from the López Obrador is to look at the development of significant infrastructure in Mexico, unrelated to power and gas or and, and oil. Uh, specifically, one of the things he's talked about is an interoceanic uh, um, pathway, sort of uh, similar to the Panama Canal that would cut across Mexico. I know canals are covered through the infrastructure topic, but I wonder, I guess the basic question is, any issues with respect to generation of confidence and investment in Mexico as it relates to infrastructure as a cover topic, particularly as it relates to AMLO's goals uh, and in this interoceanic plan? Um, and are there other big projects that you think the Mexican government would like to attract investment to that may be may suffer from not being specifically on the five on the list of five? Well, it uh, looks like we, uh, Hugo may have dropped. We'll, we'll, we'll get him back and have him answer that question. I don't know, Simon, if you have any perspective on that, uh, with that, that specific question with respect to whether or not there are issues as to coverage that may affect U.S. investment in Mexico, specifically as it relates to infrastructure. Hugo, you're back. Yes, I, I'm back. Yes, I, I was trying to unmute and... Uh, inadvertently uh, dropped out, so that was my, my bad. Uh, sorry about that. I, again, I, I, I'm not sure, and I think it's uh, somewhat early uh, to, to see uh, where Lopez Obrador uh, will go. The one thing that I, I will say in terms of the investment, foreign investors need to take a look at uh, probably two things. One of them is uh, certainly having uh, robust investment contracts. Whether they go in uh, with, with uh, sorry, with recourse to arbitration, and of course you being in the energy sector and in Houston will be very familiar with those. Uh, whether they are covered by those five sectors or not, I think it will be important for these type of uh, large projects, large infrastructure projects with uh, very hefty investments uh, to ensure that there are uh, robust, to the extent that they are done with the government or uh, with the intervention of the government to have robust uh, investment contracts with recourse to arbitration. And again, the oil and gas industry is very familiar with those. Uh, but there is no reason not to think of them in terms of um, 
uh, protection in other infrastructure projects. The other thing that I think may happen, and we did see, it, it's probably not a, a, a very good comparison, but we did see this with the NAFTA. Uh, Mexico was very clear that uh, it wanted to attract investment and that the investment chapter will, would, would help it to attract not only U.S. investment, for, but investment from everywhere else in the world. So huge companies like Nissan, LG, Samsung, Sony, so Korean companies, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, they invested in Mexico after the NAFTA was, uh, came into force through their U.S. subsidiaries. And I, I've been wondering whether, given now that we have a washdown uh, ISDS mechanism, <coughs> whether something similar can be structured by investors through other investment agreements that Mexico has. We've seen this happen elsewhere. For instance, there, there is uh, investors like very much the Dutch BITs because they are very investor friendly, if you will. Uh, and there is a lot of Dutch investment, which I am not sure that uh, the money, the, the, the capital and the resources are coming from the Netherlands, but they are certainly using the Dutch agreement uh, in terms of protection. And I've been thinking that that could happen just as it did as Korean and, and European companies invested through the U.S. in mm -hmm. Mexico to uh, uh, get protection from the NAFTA and the NAFTA investment chapter in particular, whether now it may happen uh, uh, through other uh, of Mexico's uh, investment agreements. So there, there are two things to look for. And in terms of uh, AMLO's, uh, <clears throat> you know, whether he wants to promote, uh, I don't have very high hopes uh, for AMLO. And, and we're seeing where he's going. Again, I think that he comes from uh, a background from a, a PRI background where there was a very powerful state, a very in a very powerful state intervening in all sectors of the economy. And I think that that is where he's heading, whether it is uh, 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 the energy sector, whether it is infrastructure, I think we'll, we'll see, uh, we are seeing now worrying signs and we'll continue to see more. That's my view. Thank you, Hugo. I think uh, one of the implications of what you just said is increasing importance uh, on the investment contract specifically, the private contract between the investor and the uh, third party, which I think at the end of the day would also drive additional uh, requirements for uh, lawyers and legal work to analyze that, to, to really be certain that you get the benefit of the contractual provisions that you've negotiated in that in that arrangement i wonder you know it strikes me that one uh element of this in the background negotiation if you're going to eliminate isds in a in a, you know, a thought through arbitration process and then rely on a system of national courts to resolve the dispute that inherently uh contains within it a confidence in this the system of national courts to resolve the dispute <laughs> And I wonder, and I'd like to ask Simon and Celine this question first and then see what Hugo's perspective is on it. But I wonder, Simon, I wonder if the Cato Institute has done any analysis on, for instance, the at least from a perspective uh, of the politis politization of uh, institutions in the United States recently and whether or not there, is, there may be a sense of, of you know, uh, does the rule of law apply as it did uh, as it has consistently, currently, is there an increasing sense of worry with respect to politicization of the court system in the United States specifically, not speaking about Canada? I mean, you can see that, for instance, in the discussion about the current Supreme Court uh, controversy. You know, so, so as politics continues to gain in the foreground and institutions are, are challenged, is there a worry that investors would, if they're now having to focus on utilizing a court system, that there would be some, some worry about the impact of, the, of that court system in the United States specifically as it relates to recent developments? 
Yeah, I mean, thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, thank it's you a, for the question. It's a depressing it's a question. question. Um, but yes, we're all, you know, watching the news and, and hearing the political rhetoric out there. And, you know, this kind of idea that the courts might be politicized and not, you know, completely fair, um, uh, you know, I think that it's it's always sort of been out there, but it's just being highlighted and pushed to the fore. And you know, you see worries these days about you know democracy itself in the United States. You know, do, does our do, does our democracy actually function? Can our courts uh, provide the, the the rule of law uh, that that we with, that we thought they would? Um, when you when you just constantly emphasize the the political nature of the Supreme Court and then and then lower courts, I, you know I think it's fair to ask if you're uh, an investor, uh, an American investor, a Canadian investor, a Mexican investor, certainly a Chinese investor, um, you know are are you going to get a fair shake from the U.S. courts? Um, I want to believe that we are at a in a unique time. Um, and that this too shall pass. Uh, I want to believe that, um, you know, we're in the stretch run of this uh, highly politicized, uh, you know, election. Um, you know, what happens after November 3rd? Do things start to go back to what we consider normal? Uh, or does all of this just continue on at full strength? And does that start to have an impact on investment decisions? I mean, what we've seen so far in the midst of all this is a, a stock market that, that seems to be confident. Why are, why, are invest, why are those investors so confident in the midst of all this chaos? I don't have a good explanation for it. So, so I think it's right to worry about these things. Um, I, I hope that uh, it, it's a bit overblown and some of us are just spending too much time um, watching CNN or on Twitter, and that the real world of investment is, is a little more, you know, sort of stable. You know, sort of stable. Um, um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you, Simon. I think your your hope is uh, everybody's hope that that uh, that the institutions are reinforced over time. I wonder, Celine, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take yeah. a slightly different take on the. The question, one might wonder, uh, because Canada agreed not to have ISDS in uh, the USMCA between uh, Canada and the US, whether this shows uh, a change of policy. Are we not going to have ISDS anymore? And looking just at recent past practice, uh, I would say no. I don't think Canada is going back on its general policy of having ISDS or an improved form, I'll come back to that in a minute, of a dispute settlement resolution between investor and state. I'll just mention a few examples, the CPTPP that actually binds Canada and Mexico, there is ISDS. So between us, we go under a different agreement to resolve disputes in uh, the CETA agreement Canada has with Europe. It's an investment court system, so a different model, but still a way uh, to resolve investor state uh, disputes. And in recent bilateral uh, investment treaties signed by Canada, we also included ISDS. So I don't think Canada is going to abandon this uh, as I think there is still a, a need for investor uh, protection uh, around the world where Canadian investors are uh, involved. And the last thing I'll say is uh, Canada so far appears to uh, support or is committing to supporting a multilateral investment court. So one might question whether this is still ISDS uh, or not, but I think we're still in the realm where uh, it is believed to be important to afford some uh, remedies to investors uh, abroad. Thank you, Celine. I think your comments uh, highlight that the changes in ISDS in the USMCA were really initiated by the United States. It was not, you know, if Canada is continuing to rely on ISDS and other trade agreements, and you don't foresee a change, that sort of reinforces the idea that this change, specific to the USMCA, was a U.S. born concept. Um, we do have a question from the audience. The question is, and I don't know, Hugo, if you can respond to this. The question is, 
Are there any differences in investment protection for electric energy infrastructure that is not covered by oil and gas infrastructure? I, I, I guess if I were going to initiate that discussion, it would be, you know, clearly the, the power generation, supply, supply of power generation services is a covered topic by ISDS. I wonder if the questioner is asking about all the other related infrastructure like grid, the you know, development of the grid and other things. I don't know if you, Hugo, if you have a perspective on that. Yep, uh, two comments on that. First of all, uh, yes, it would be covered, but uh, we have to make the distinction. Is it covered under general investments or in the five specific sectors. So, so, of course, oil and gas, which is one of the sectors, does not include all the energy sector. It's only oil and gas. Uh, electricity is only covered as an individual sector in terms of power generation, where it is provided as a public service on behalf of the state. So the full-fledged uh, protection in terms of ISDS for the, the electricity sector only applies to power generation in these circumstances and provided that there is a contract, a government contract that has been signed. Otherwise, it is still covered, it is still protected, but it falls under the other, the general investment. So claims for ISDS, let, let, let me take a step back. It would be covered by the investment protections. Uh, ISDS would only be, av be available for national treatment, MFN, and direct exploration claims, and only if it relates uh, to power generation with the characteristics that I've mentioned. ISDS claim or, or claims could be brought into ISDS uh, with respect to all other provisions in Chapter 14. I think that would be the answer. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so uh, she, the, the, the questioner goes on to say, uh, her specific inquiry as it relates to energy storage uh, of renewable uh, power, so for instance, battery storage. It strikes me, if there's a battery storage infrastructure project in Mexico, that would also relate to power generation because the battery storage would be related to addressing intermittent failure of power supply as it relates to, you know, hey, when the wind's not blowing, you've got to use some other capacity to generate power. That could be, for instance, battery. So it strikes me that it should be covered by the explicit uh, addressing of power generation, although that, you know, partly some of this has got to be developed through test cases, um, although I think that that one specifically should be addressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hugo, you were, just, you were just discussing, you know, other investments in Mexico, and this is not just an important topic for Mexico, but it's also for U.S. investment, and so I like the, Simon's view and the Canadian investment in Mexico. I like Celine's view on this, and that is, you know, there's a lot of discussion about other U.S. investment that are not addressed by the five topics, and so, for instance, um, you, the, you, you discussed uh, issues as to most favored nation, issues as to national treatment, and then uh, issues as to direct expropriation. So there is discussion about, you know, typically if there's an investment, in a, in the, a significant investment, and there were to be an, an attempt to circumvent that investment or otherwise affect it negatively, T you know, typically direct expropriation is not the way the mechanism that a party would utilize. It would be through some indirect manner that that investment would be undercut. So the fact that the word direct is immediately before expropriation seems to me and seems to other parties to effectively narrow the scope of the utilization of ISDS as it relates to these to those topics. I wonder what your thought is because it strikes me that the worry among the investment class has got to be what is what's going to happen to this project if I invest billions of dollars in the project. I understand I'm, I'm going to cover it if there's a direct expropriation, but what about indirect mechanisms, regulatory changes, changes in law, other things that have the exact same impact but are not 
within the four corners of the words. And I wonder, I wonder if you, you, I'd like to get your perspective on that, Hugo, and also from the U.S. perspective of investment in New Mexico, Simon, and, and Canadian investment in New Mexico, Celine. Certainly, uh, George. Thank you. Certainly, uh, George. Well, one of the, uh, uh, I mean, that is one of the implications of having ended with a wash down ISDS mechanism. As far as expropriation goes, it only covers direct expropriation, and that requires a taking by the state. If there is no taking by the state, but nevertheless, the, the you know, the whole investment, uh, it goes to zero value. It may well fall under uh, indirect expropriation, but that is not subject to ISDS. And this leads me to a couple of uh, other points that I wanted to make that uh, both Simon and Celine referred to, and that is, are they covered uh, by the state of state dispute settlement uh, mechanism, and what are the implications there? And uh, I think that it is debatable that they are covered. I think that they may be covered, but again, in a very washed down way. Because the main concept in state-to-state -state dispute settlement is one that we've borrowed from the GATT, the concept of nullification or, or impairment. And that is, you know, when not the investors, but the state's interests have been nullified or in some way impaired, and that may lead to compensation in another form, not as Celine very well pointed out through damages that may be paid to the investor, but you know, can you, can uh, the US raise tariffs in retaliation for a breach of the investment provisions? Since chapter 14 is not subject to nullification or impairment, you may end up with a decision that has virtually no force, maybe a recommendation, a, a finding that perhaps, let's say in this case, Mexico has breached the agreement, but there is no compensation to the investor and no possibility of retaliation by compensating the nullification or, or impairment of benefits through chapter 31. So even uh, the whole investment chapter has been washed down, not only in, in, in the context of ISDS, but also in the context of the state-to-state -state dispute settlement. As far as Mexico goes, and I come back to, to your prior question uh, that, that uh, Celine and Simon referred to, uh, are, you know, and the, what of the courts? The one bit of good news there is that the NAFTA, or the new NAFTA, the USMCA now, is Mexican law because of how Mexico, you know, uh, how uh, the, the status of international agreements in Mexican law. So a breach of the NAFTA can be taken directly to the Mexican courts, and Mexican courts would have jurisdiction to view to review allegations of breach of the USMCA, there would be, the remedy would not be damages, but they would have that jurisdiction. And this goes back, you know, to, to a different question. Are domestic courts well equipped to deal with those international law issues? That's a separate matter, but at least, while well, the remedy, as Celine very well pointed out, may not be uh, equivalent, Mexican courts would have jurisdiction to uh, review whether Mexico has breached the USMCA directly. Thank you, Hugo. So there is a remedy. It's just a remedy in the Mexican courts. Simon, I don't know if you or Celine have a perspective on this uh, potential indirect expropriation. Expro yeah, uh, 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 I'll go quickly. Go uh, so yeah, just a quick point here, not to get too academic and theoretical about it, but there there are conceptions of national treatment 
that are quite broad. And you might think of it as, well, you know, we need to prove that the, the, the government was discriminating uh, on the basis of our nationality and sort of, you know, across the whole uh, sector. Uh, but there's an argument that people have made that, look, you know, we're a foreign company and, and we were treated worse than this one other domestic company over here. Um, and that's enough for a national treatment violation. So, and I don't, that interpretation, I don't think is maybe not widely accepted, but I mean, I think there are avenues for um, you know, making some of these kind of broader claims about sort of fairness and you know how we were badly treated uh, in, in the national treatment uh, in probably MFN context. So uh, you know I would I would say for investors and their lawyers, all hope is not lost here. Uh, there there may still be ways to to get some of these claims in. Just briefly to answer the question about uh, Canadian investors in Mexico. Uh, that um, if there was a claim, then it would be it should be made under the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement because in there you do have traditional ISDS and you have the provision on expropriation that covers both direct and indirect expropriation. So then uh, investors could just avoid the USMCA and go to the CPTPP. Excellent. Well, uh, I think we're near the end of our time now and uh, I want to thank each of our excellent uh, and, and uh, knowledgeable presenters and I hope this has been a, a helpful exercise. I know I've enjoyed the conversation and learned a few things from our from our panelists. David, I don't know if you want to have any if, any closing remarks. No, just to thank no, the panelists, just... Andy, you for present making Excellent presentations, very interesting, and I think very informative, certainly for me, and I suspect for most of our audience as well. So thanks again. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.